I'm in the Barossa Valley, one of the richest and most intriguing parts of Australia. Beautiful views, fantastic wine, great accommodation. You can even live in a tree if you want to. Really, I know it sounds like a nursery rhyme, but there was an old man who lived in a tree. This tree. Weird or what? <laughs> This week, I'm sniffing and sampling South Australia's Barossa Valley. From Springton to Angerston and down to Tanunda. I'll raise a glass to a shonky doctor. This is for his team. <laughs> Can you trust this man? Fill the streets with beautiful music. I like it! And try my hand at kegeling. I think I put a bit of spin on that. This is why we do walks like this, isn't it? This is the fellow who lived in the tree. His name was Johann Friedrich Herbig. He was a penniless immigrant from Prussia in Germany. And when he got here, he leased 80 acres of this land, but he was totally skinned, so he couldn't afford a house, and did what a lot of the indigenous people did. He lived in this tree all by himself for three years. And then, excuse me, could, could I borrow you for a, sure. a, for a moment? Then he got married. I hope you don't mind this quick proposal. Here we are. So now the two of us are living in this tree, and we were here for about a year until... Can I borrow you now? Uh, what's your name? Matilda. Matilda. Matilda, you are now a little boy, and you're called August, because you were born in August, OK? And the three of us actually lived in this tree together until 12 months later. Can I have you now? What's your name? Jesse. Jesse, right. You're now Wilhelm. Uh, and the four of us all lived in the trees. So we, here's where we sleep. There's the kitchen. There's the bedroom. Until eventually we decided we wanted to have another child and we built ourselves a hut. I don't blame us, really, do you? Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs> And they didn't go far. Just a few hundred metres up the road, in fact. And this is it. This is the actual hut where Johann Friedrich and his two sons and his wife, Caroline, lived. And although it sounds like a really charming story, it's actually a tale of enormous destitution and, and hardship. Take Caroline, for instance. She was just 16 when she arrived in Australia. The next year, she was brutally attacked, ravaged, and left for dead. Back then, she could have become an outcast, but Johan gave her a home and a family. Eventually, this place got too small for them, and they moved into this house. It's wonderful the way they stepped up and up. It's a bit better than a tree, this, isn't it? Eventually, they had 16 children, and Carolyn adopted one of her sisters as well. So she was looking after 17 children. And to me, this is an archetypical story. This was a, a, a woman who never spoke any English, destitute when she came here, but by the time of her death, her children were doing fantastically well. And now, as you can see, it's, it's virtually a little palace here, isn't it? Great story. The Herbigs now have a big family tree of a different kind, with over 800 descendants. The Barossa isn't a town like most of the places I walk through. It's a series of villages and wineries. And my next stop is about 30 kilometres away. But if you think I'm schlepping all the way there on foot, you're mistaken. This pom has hired a car. I'm heading north to one of the oldest towns in the district. As you can see, Angerston hasn't changed much since the 1850s. I imagine it's the sort of place where everyone knows everyone and their business. An old-fashioned town with old-fashioned values. When you're doing a, a 
television programme like this, one of the best ways of researching is to get the local newspaper. And so I picked this up and I noticed this editorial which says, respect, it seems, is rapidly vanishing in all walks of life in almost every quarter of society today. This ranges from declining customer service standards to people refusing to provide the simple apology for getting things wrong. Quite right. But then I looked at the name of the, um, of the editor, and it is... Tony Robinson. Is it me? Is that what I do in my spare time? Who knows? Well, there's no mystery about who put the Angus in Anguston. International capitalist George Fife Angus. It was his money that built the Barossa, paid for the first wave of settlers, and set up churches and charities. Sounds like naming the town after him was the least they could do. Mind you, one bloke here found out George wasn't someone you should cross. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but do you know which famous Barossa figure lived here in the 1850s? Horace Dean. Horace Dean, absolutely right. It was Horace Dean. Uh, do you know what Horace Dean did? He practised as a doctor. He practised as a doctor, that's right. So what I want to know is... <laughs> Can you trust a man called Horace? And this is <laughs> Horace team. <laughs> Wide-eyed Horace here was an American and, as it turned out, a bit of a rogue. In 1850, he put up his doctor's shingle here in Anguston. Horace and George Fife Angus got on well at first, but when the doc tried to challenge George's authority, things turned nasty. Dean wanted to start a, a, a district authority here, and Angus was opposed to it. And eventually, Angus wrote to America and checked his medical qualifications, and the people wrote back and said, no, he wasn't a real doctor at all. He was a fake. And so Horace was exposed. Then he turns up again in New South Wales, and he stood as a local politician three times. The first two times he was disbarred. There's a theme running through his life, I feel. <laughs> and the third time he got in as a local politician and he was kicked out after six months because he was so rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wondered whether or not you would be prepared to raise a toast to one of the great anti-heroes of the Barossa. Would you be um, Horace Dean for us? Oh, I suppose I can do that, yes. Thank you very much. You could just, just hold that in, in front of you. That... <laughs> That's quite believable, isn't it? Beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, will you drink a toast to the great Horace Dean? Horace Dean. <laughs> <laughs> You're his wife? I am. Oh, I'll, I'll let me leave that for you to look at tonight. <laughs> Thank you. I think you'll be in luck tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to take some more time to, um, well, you know, but I must get on. I was just on my way down to Tanunda and I saw a sign for a farmer's market. It doesn't look much from here, does it? But there's quite a lot of noise coming from inside there. It's a red wine based Belsheri. Yeah. Aged in barrel for eight years. Kennel sage and garlic. Oh, thank you. You will have filled up by the time you go around, that's for sure. <laughs> this is so good. Like it? <laughs> the Barossa region's now becoming as famous for its food as it is for its wine. And I'm not the only one who's noticed. Look who I've seen. Tetsuya. You're a Sydney boy, aren't you? Yes, I am. So what are you doing here? Well, here is a, we do an event on uh, tomorrow. So just start prep today. So uh, we just arrive and then I'm 
just looking around the market to organize the produce for the dinner. You've got one of the most famous, most successful restaurants <laughs> in the whole of Australia. What do you think of this place? I mean, shock, surprise, a nice surprise. Yeah, me too. I mean, produce are so good. I mean, I go other market, it's other, nothing against it, you know, nothing wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. But this is a more real people's market. Absolutely. That's how I feel. Yeah, that's how I felt. Because like a farmer's market, you yes. kind of go, <laughs> another farmer's market, it'll be exactly the same as the last one. Yes. But here, the food is so good and the people are so committed, aren't yes. they? Lots of small, ambitious businesses. It's real. I respect that, you know, yeah. produce, just, even just a little salad leaves has actual taste. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Very nice meeting you. Nice to see you. Bye. Today, my walk is a drive around South Australia's beautiful Barossa Valley. I've barked up an unusual family tree, made an appointment with a rogue doctor, and blown my diet at a country farmer's market. Right, I'm off to Tanunda now. Come on, get your skates on. All right, all right, I know I should be walking off all that lovely local produce I was stuffing my face with before, but it's about 10 k's to Tanunda from here. Besides, it's the perfect opportunity to enjoy the scenery and remind yourself that fabulous Barossa wines come from fabulous Barossa vines. I love these old vines. They look really great, don't they? Look at this gnarled old beast. It's pretty good, isn't it? Excuse me. Excuse me. There you go. Can you tell me anything about these vines? Oh, these vines? Yeah. Well, to us, they're, they're quite significant. These, these, these vines were planted back in 1843. Really? Who yeah. by? Uh, it was a German migrant called Christian Oricht. And uh, him, as well as the, the fellow uh, settlers, were all planting vines, you know, early in the 1800s. And they were on to something. By the 1890s, the Barossa was filled with wineries making a killing, selling fortified wine to us poms. And uh, because these are unique as far as they've never had phylloxera or disease, that it does make them some of the oldest uh, surviving vines in the world. Yeah. yeah, I suppose just the fact that they've survived means they must be making pretty good wine. Exactly. If they weren't, they wouldn't be in the ground. Sure. Yeah. T take a look at this, will you? Have a, have a good look. Because that is possibly the oldest vine, not only in the Barossa, not only in Australia, but possibly in the universe, I think you would agree. Uh, I would agree with that. It doesn't matter whether it's old or not. Damn good wine. Now, usually, I'd be sampling some of what those vines could offer, but this is a walk. No, actually, it's a drive, so better not. Besides, things are starting to turn a bit nasty down in Tanunda. I am afraid I'm resorting to, to using this from now on. Hey, look at that bloke. Some people never stop working, do they? <laughs> you get... Oh, very nice, oh, yay. You get town cries all over the world, don't you? It is frankly a bit balmy. <laughs> yes, oh <and> yay! <laughs> Are you open? Yeah. Can I dump this down? Thank you very much. Normally on a walk like this, I wouldn't dream of going into a museum or an art gallery because however good they are, there's one in every town and city, isn't there? But it's pouring with rain, so... You've just got to make do. These are pretty nice, aren't they? Look at all this stuff. It says here that they're all being scrubbed off the wall tomorrow because they're only part of a festival, which seems a bit of a pity, doesn't it? Zach, 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 Zach! Come in here. Look at this. Look, look, look. How about that, then? Wow. When the pipe organ was installed in the Adelaide Town Hall in 1877. It was the largest organ in the colony. I'm not surprised, are you? Isn't that magnificent? Normally these things are, are so heavy and oppressive, aren't they? But this is why we do walks like this, isn't it? So that you just happen upon things like the, 
like a musical instrument the size of a house. I think that is so great. Hmm, still no change in the weather. I'll need a safe haven. I think I'll make like the Barossa's original 19th century Lutheran settlers and try a place of worship. Oh, that's better. One thing that is really noticeable in the Barossa is the number of churches that there are. And when you come into a quiet, contemplative place like this, it's hard to imagine quite how angry those original German worshippers got with each other. Ian, they never stopped rowing, did they? They did not. They started in Germany and kept it up when they came to South Australia. What was it that they used to disagree with each other about? Well, the big argument between the two synods was when the thousand-year empire of God would come to earth. And some believed it would come tomorrow or the next day, depending, they'd put it off and then some believed it was way down the track. So if you thought the world was going to end tomorrow, then you might stay worshipping in this church, but if you thought it was going to be down the track, then you'd go off and start another church. Oh, that's exactly right. And, um, and, and if they didn't like each other, they might at choir practice ring the bells to disturb their service and things like that. No, there, there was quite a bit of antagonism and they disagreed very quickly. I think at one stage there were 38 branches of the Lutheran Church in Australia. And the pastors used to preach in a really fiery, devil-rejecting way, didn't they? Oh, yes, and in the older Lutheran churches, the altar was right up there in the centre. And the pastor used to light bits of paper and throw it down into the congregation as it happened and said, this is what will happen to you if you don't behave yourself. It is the real fire and brimstone has the fiery bits of paper descended on the congregation. All of these stories sound quite funny, don't they? And also a long time ago. But in fact, this sort of practice was still going on in the 20th century. Absolutely. When did it end? Well, 1966. And, but people still remember which church their p parents went to. And it still lingers a bit today, but it will be gone in a generation. But is this that explains why there are so many churches in the Barossa? Exactly. Four in this tiny town. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, <laughs> that's <laughs> really interesting. Bye. It might have been fire and brimstone in church, but those turn-of-the-century Lutherans did have their lighter, dare I say, wacky side. If I can just find an unsuspecting crowd, I'll show you what I mean. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm sorry to disturb you. Now, this is about a thing called tin kettling. Have any of you ever heard of it? Yes? yes? Have you ever done any tin kettling? Oh, well, look, would you three mind going to ask these ladies whether we could blag sufficient musical instruments in order to do the demonstration? Brilliant. OK. Tin kettling. This took place normally on the night before a wedding, and the bridesmaids and the bride would be at home demurely plucking the down off feathers in order to stuff the marital duvet, while the blokes would be outside and they'd tie down the horses and tie down the dogs. Oh, this is great, look, the stuff's coming. Uh, and then they would collect up tin cans and saucepans and kerosene cans, and they would start bashing them outside the bride's house until eventually the bride gave in and she would open the door and she would give them homemade wine and bits of cake. So that essentially is what we need to do now to recreate the tin kettling. Yes, we're warming up now. And one, two, three, four, and it is good. That's good. I like it. Oh, come on. Yeah. That's good. You got the door? In telly, this is known as a spontaneous crowd scene. In legal circles, it's known as creating a public nuisance and we could probably be arrested. Mind you, it wouldn't be the first time. In fact, right here in Tanunda, in 1903, 
A tin kettling took place. It got very rowdy. Some bloke knifed another one with a little pen knife. And eventually, a whole load of people were arrested and charged with noisy conduct or whatever it was in those days. 18 of them were found guilty and fined five shillings. So I think um, it's probably prudent if we... That's it. Keep going, keep going, but very softly. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've spent most of the day in South Australia's Barossa Valley, which is, of course, one of the country's premier wine regions, and I've barely had a drop. I wonder if I can knock a few down in here. takes me back to my, my feckless youth, my days of 10-pin bowling, but uh, I guess this isn't actually 10-pin bowling, is it? No, that's right. It's 9-pin bowling, kegling. Originally, it was uh, from Germany. Yeah. And when the immigrants emigrated all over the world, they took the game with them, and it's, it came here to Australia, and they established it here in 1858. So they've been playing it here all that time? Yes. And are there many of these alleys left now? No, this is the only traditional one in the Southern Hemisphere. Can I have a go? Oh, absolutely. Come on, my son. In the early days, the settlers would bring out their kegels after church. Every pin they knocked down absolved a sin. Me, I'll settle for points. Oh. <laughs> Very good. So, we'll have a look at the scores over here. Yeah. What's this, a yes. poodle? A Minus one point. A poodle is, it goes off the alley yeah. and goes into the gutter. All right, here we go. I do not wish to get a poodle. 30 coming up. You can do it. That'll be a good one. Yes! Oh. Well, thank you ever so much, guys. I, I really feel like a proper Kegel player now. I'm not, not one poodle. Before you go... We'd like to make you an honorary member of our Kegel Club. Hey, it's a measure. How's this then? Oh. <laughs> well, now that I'm a member, perhaps I should have one more bowl. Oh. Yeah. Very good. Bye. Bye, Tandy. Bye. Here's a funny thing. In 19th century New York, Kegel was actually banned by law. Apparently, it used to get so rowdy that eventually the coppers stopped them from playing anything that involved the knocking down of nine pins. So they stuck another pin in front, and that was the birth of 10-pin bowling. Right, off with the Kegel shirt and on with my drinking pants. I've left one of South Australia's best, and I do mean the best, for last. You may wonder, excuse me, why I'm walking through a bottle shop. Well, the answer is I have come to worship at the shrine of Grange, Grange Hermitage, Grange Hermitage, the most iconic, the most famous of all Australian wines, which was started in 1951 by a young winemaker called Max Schubert. His idea was that he wanted to make a full-blooded Australian wine that would be better if you left it for a while. So he made some, laid it down, following year, made some more, laid it down, and the next year, and the next year, until it was time for him to give his bosses a taste. And he went into the office, he uncorked it, that's the sound effect, and he tipped it out, and he gave it to them, and they said... They hated it. They absolutely loathed it. And poor old Max was absolutely mortified. But he was a determined fella. Even though his bosses wrote and told him to stop making the stuff, Max kept laying more down in secret. Until about 10 years after the first laying down of the Hermitage, word started to get through to his bosses that this wine 
was not only rather tasty and rather good, but very, very sellable. And they wrote him another letter saying, uh, would you mind laying some more down? Could you, could you start again? Of course, he'd never stopped, had he? And thank goodness he hadn't, because he had produced this most wonderful Australian wine, which you are no longer allowed to call Hermitage, although you probably never did, or Hermitage, which you might well have, because the French say that Australians aren't allowed to call an Australian wine by a French name, which I think is a bit babyish, don't you? Oh, and by the way, if you want a bottle, a very large bottle and a very good bottle, that's what it's gonna set you back, all right? So, have I enjoyed my day's drive come walk through the Barossa? Well, I think you know the answer to that question. Just don't go shouting about it, all right? I'm really split down the middle because half of me wants to rave about it and the other half wants to keep quiet because I'm frightened that if too many people come here, they'll muck it all up. Nevertheless, if you do happen to uh, drop by, you must try the cheese and the uh, bread and the peppers and the olives. and the meat and the wine. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.